May I first apologize that I'm not with you in person, but in these days of COVID, the fact that I'm over 80 and have got pre-medical conditions dictate that I should do it this way. Firstly, I would like to thank the university for bestowing on me this great honor. And I'd also like to thank all of you for allowing me to give you this address. Delivering this address today reminds me of the only other time that I addressed the student body at this university. And that was more than half a lifetime ago, in the bad old days of apartheid, when I was a sitting member of the then South African Parliament and had just been expelled from my party caucus. It's a long story why I was expelled, but let me explain it this way. A special caucus meeting was called. There was only one item, and that was my future in the caucus. And every member of parliament in that caucus had an opportunity to speak, and they all spoke. And it was quite clear to me that my fate was already sealed. And I can probably put it best by giving you the speech of the person who sat next to me. And when his turn came, he stood up, looking at the chairman, he said, Mr. Chairman, it's time the United Party. And then he paused, looked down at me, and said, expressed its bowels. One of the side effects of being expelled from my caucus was that I had my 15 moments of fame. All the papers were full of me. When I got up to speak in Parliament the next day, instead of people leaving their seats the moment I stood up, and those remaining hardly listening to what I had to say, the benches were full. Every member of Parliament was there. The galleries were full. The press were all there. That is something that had never happened to me before. Not only that, but I was getting invitations for speaking engagements. Two of them, one was from what was then called the Peter Maritzburg campus of the University of Natal, and another was from this institution, from Wits University. At Peter Maritzburg, they set up a debate between me and a member of my previous party. I'm not exaggerating when I say that whilst I was treated as a returning hero, my poor opponent got a complete roasting, was treated with disdain, and as he left the stage, it was taboos and slow clapping. The debate at Wits was different. It was a protest meeting against the apartheid government, and I was privileged to be one of the speakers. But when I got up to speak, I wasn't the returning hero. I was given a roasting like you cannot believe. The viewpoint of the student body was that the South African Parliament of that day was completely illegitimate and that any member of the opposition who thought it was doing some good was nothing less than a useful idiot, a pawn in the hands of the National Party in their endeavour to give the pretense that this body had some legitimacy. The fact is, although I was perhaps hurt at the time, the students were absolutely right. And that fact was brought into stark focus when, a few years later, the then leader of the opposition, Dr. Frederick von Sobert, got up in Parliament and in a speech which forensically dissected the National Party the government of South Africa, the parliament of South Africa, and yes, even the opposition. He showed it to be the absolute past that it was. And at the end of that speech, he resigned as leader of the opposition in parliament. He resigned as a member of the party, which he had led until that moment. He resigned as a member of parliament. And to the shock and horror of both sides of the house, he walked to the middle of the aisle 
and slowly walked out of that house. After that, Dr. Slubbett involved himself in extra-parliamentary politics, and one of the things which he achieved was a meeting between the ANC in exile and Afrikaner intellectuals at Dakar, which, in my opinion, was an important milestone on our road to democracy. The other day, I was listening to a lecture by Dr. Mark Carney. He was the um, governor of the Bank of Canada and then later governor of the Bank of England. And this was the first of a series of lectures which Dr. Carney was invited to give. The point that he was making in this lecture was that we as humanity faced three crises. We faced a crisis of credit, we faced a COVID crisis, and we faced a climate crisis. He believed that the reason why we were facing these dire crises was because we as human beings only valued that which could be monetized. And as an example, he suggested we look at the Amazon. The Amazon company, we all admired and we all valued and we all understood. It was the most valuable company in the world. But very few of us had any care for the Amazon, the region. What I would like to do is look at the point that Dr. Carney was making, but from a slightly different point of view. I'd like us to look at what happened in the 170,000 years that Homo sapiens has been around. It's a very short time for a species. And if you look at the first 170,000, say to the year I was born, the population had grown from those few in the savannas to two billion people. And then in my lifetime, it doubled from two to four billion, and it's doubled again from four to eight billion. So today, we have eight billion people on this planet. In addition, Technology has grown as rapidly as the population. So our reach, our technological reach today is extraordinary. Not only have we completely dominated this planet, not to its benefit as far as I'm concerned, but we're now looking at space. We want to dominate the whole space around us. In this endeavor, we have completely lost sight of quality. Our focus is purely on quantity. Quantity is quality which has first been objectified, then commoditized, and finally monetized. For example, if you take the Amazon, the short-term interests of very few people are served by cutting down the forest and polluting the river, while the long-term interests of all of us globally is served by preserving this extraordinary, beautiful and important part of our Earth. In fact, we've got to a stage where we can't see the forest for the trees. If we take stock of the world today, we find that we are led mainly by populists, who seek to use the technology that exists to divide communities. One look at Trump's America has seen how this technology has been used to divide half of America against the other half. And if you compare the state of America today with the leadership it showed at the end of the Second World War, where through the Marshall Plan it revived Germany and Japan to be the extraordinary states that they are today, one will recognize if we're looking to America to solve the problems of credit, COVID, and climate, I don't think we have much chance of success. The question that I'd like to ask is, will it take 
another 80 million deaths for the world to wake up to the fact that we all have to pull together to overcome the problems we face. And it is in this sense that I think we have to start developing that which is of quality in our lives and not be so obsessed with that which is quantity. In other words, we have to find each other as human beings. We have to unite around our common human dignity. You know, there's a great paradox about us human beings. As Dr. Carney says, we value that which we can monetize. But if you look back over the past generations and understand what we, this generation, value about those generations, it's not that which is monetized. It is that of quality. We value the arts. We value the philosophers. We value the thinkers. That is what we value. What does this paradox tell us? I think it tells us that the solution isn't to be found in quantity, but it's to be found in ideas that liberate our collective imagination. And I want to suggest that what it is that liberates our imagination can be found in the arts. This brings me back to the reason why I'm the recipient of this great honor. I have been fortunate enough to work with many, many people in presenting young talent of South Africa, both nationally and internationally. In 2004, to celebrate 10 years of democracy, we took 17 young emerging artists, a performing arts company that performed musical theatre, and a film, Carmen and Kailicha, that went on to win the best film at the Berlin Film Festival to New York. And one could see they were visibly impacted by what they saw and experienced. They saw us not just as the other from some place in Africa, but they saw us as creative people who they could understand and empathize with and relate to. In looking at the exhibition from a tactical point of view, the impression it made on political thinking and investor perceptions was nothing short of miraculous. In my opinion, art is the best calling card the world has. By bringing your art to other parts of the world, what they see is your creativity. They see things that they can relate to and not the politics which divides us. It is because of our great belief in the amazing creativity of South African artists that we have put the passion and resources behind helping to promote them both nationally and internationally. I'm very much aware that medicine is an exact science, but I implore you, when you deal with your patients, use the head of a scientist, but the heart of an artist. I thank you.